Hi, I'm Seben Yakov. This presentation is entitled Loss Reduction When Connecting MOSFETs in Parallel, and this is also a comment on a TI application note. I'd like to thank Evgeny for his assistance in preparing this presentation. In an application note or reference design by TI, they are showing an inverter for a motor. It's a three phase inverter and each phase is driven by a half bridge which is composed of five transistors each of the switches in parallel. There are five transistors in parallel, so this is one half bridge actually. And then there are three units like this and they are driven by gate drivers and then there is a controller here. There's also a explanation of the conduction losses of the MOSFETs in this connection, this is the conductive losses, and also the total conductive losses of the system, and there is some conclusion. I'll get back to it after I'll explain uh, my approach to calculating the conduction losses of a parallel connected FET. Let me start first with a very basic concept. If I have two cases here, one is one transistor and then N transistor in parallel, same current is passing through these two configurations, then there are actually two cases. One in which each one of these transistors has the same resistance as this one. In this case, of course, the total resistance of these transistors is lower by N as compared to this one. So therefore the power per transistor will be first of all divided by N and then again divided by N because uh, the power is now distributed within these transistors. So the, po the power per transistor will be the power as compared to this one divided by N squared. But to be more realistic and to compare apples to apples, I need to compare a case in which the total resistance of this one is the same as the total resistance as this one. In this case, the total power dissipated will be of course the same because the same resistance is here as here, but the power dissipated by each one of these transistors will be divided by N because we have N transistors. Okay, so it's very important to distinguish between these two cases. Let me move now to the case of a half bridge. I have two transistors. This is the inductor or inverter, it will be a motor, and there is a current, and there is of course the possibility of cur current coming out or in into the midpoint. Let's assume that the current is coming out. We have this current, if it's a sinusoidal waiver, it could be also a synchronous uh, buck, of course, and here I'm referring to a inverter, so the current will have a so-called electrical frequency, this is the electrical frequency, as distinguished from the switching frequency, okay, the PWM itself. So we have a current coming out, and at any particular point we have a duty cycle, here it is, and I'm taking a slice here looking at one period of the switching cycle, and then we have sometime this upper transistor is conducting, here it is, and then sometime this lower transistor is conducting, here it is. Notice that in this case the current goes this direction, and the other case it goes in the opposite direction to have the same direction in the inductor, okay? So, what happens here in terms of conduction losses? As far as this uh, current here, be, be it a inductor or motor, it sees at any given point RDS on, either for this upper side or for this. So basically we have a situation that any given time, every given instant, the current is passing through RDS on. So therefore the total loss of this configuration on the average is I square RDS on. Now if you look at the upper transistor or the lower transistor, then it will be half this value because half of the time uh, the upper transistor is conducting in on the average and I am talking about the total period of the 
electrical frequency, okay? I'm talking about the total period here of the whole thing. And then for this total period, half of the time we have conduction of the upper transistor and half of the time we have of the lower transistor and therefore the power dissipated is the same. You come to this conclusion without actually worrying about the, what is the type of modulation, if it is a sinusoidal modulation or a space vector, does not matter. Half the time this upper transistor is conducting, half the time the other one, you see one RDS on when you look into the midpoint of the half bridge and this is the result. The total power dissipated is I square RDS on and the total dissipated per switch in the half bridge is half of it. Now what happens if you have a transistor? Well obviously if you have n transistors then the resistance here is RDS on over n and the same thing goes now if I look now at each one of the transistors themselves then first of all the power the total power is divided by 2 and then I'm distributing the power through n transistors in parallel so I come up with this equation for the power dissipated by each transistor when they are parallel having the same RDS on so it is I square RDS on of each transistor divided by 2 this is because of the power and N square N square because the RDS on the effective resistor is RDS on over N and then it's distributed between the N transistor so another N and this is why this N square but we have to be very careful when comparing the N parallel transistor case with the single case. Now obviously you have to compare the case in which the N transistors have the same resistance as the single one. Otherwise it's not comparing apples to heaven. This is something else. I mean if you have N transistors and the total resistance is lower, how, in, how can you compare it to the one transistor? So if you compare the total conduction loss for n transistor in parallel and compare it to a case in which you have one transistor but the same silicon area or same RDS on I should say then the total power dissipated will be the same but per transistor of course here it will be divided by n because uh, the power, the total power is distributed between the n transistors but there is a refinement to this conduction loss estimation. Here I'm showing a case in which you have again current coming out, a certain duty cycle, and I'm pointing out that the distribution between the conduction loss of this transistor and this transistor at any given point, not on the average, but any given point, is dependent on the duty cycle. Like here, I have a duty cycle which is um, high and therefore most of the time this transistor is conducting while this one is a shorter time. On the other hand if the duty cycle is low then of course we have the, the other case in which the upper transistor is conducting for a short time and the lower transistor a lower time. But as I have said earlier on the average it's averaging out and everything is again are the same in the sense that uh, if you know the total power you can divide it by these two for on the average. So here I'm showing a simulation, it's a PSIM simulation. It has this control part which we are not showing here. This is the motor and then we have the driver here, the inverter and I'm going to show four points. This is the upper current, lower current, the drive of the upper side transistor and then the midpoint. And here it is, this is for a given duty cycle. We have the drive here, PWM of the upper transistor, we have the current of the high side MOSFET, we have the current of the low side 
Moffat, you see that the current here is negative. If you consider the current from drain to source positive, then here we have current from source to drain, okay? As I've shown earlier. So then we have the midpoint, which is generating the average voltage at this particular point. Now, however, suppose we are looking at the peak value, okay? At the peak value. And in particular, we are looking at the case in which we have either a very high modulation index or very low modulation index, okay? In this case, it is a very high modulation index, and we are looking at this area, we're going to see a high du large duty cycle, so this transistor, upper transistor is conducting most of the time, and the lower transistor or transistors will conduct at a shorter time. Now, if the modulation index is very low, then we have the reverse. Uh, the conduction of the upper side is very short because we don't need a lot of average voltage, but then the conduction of the lower side is much longer. Now, notice that the height of the current has nothing to do with the modulation index. It has to do with the load. That is, you can have high current with a high modulation index or a low modulation. It's the same thing. It's just a question of what is the load. Of course, the load and the modulation index will determine the magnitude of the current. But the point is that the current can be high in both cases. So if this time, however, is long, okay, meaning that I have, if it's a motor, it has the certain RPM, and this RPM is translated into a electrical frequency. So if this RPM is low, say 100, like we are start moving with the car uphill, and then it, depending on the number of poles of the motor, we get a certain electrical frequency. And in this particular example, it's three hertz, okay? And this is again when we have a, for example, a low RPM and high torque as we trying to move up the car, say. Then we have this current or this situation of a duty cycle, I should say, for a long time. So on the average, the high side and low side will dissipate the same power. But for this period of time, which could be long in terms of the thermal conduction of the transistor. This could be a very long time. Like if it is a hundreds of milliseconds, we have a problem. We do need a lot of thermal capacity to make sure that the temperature will not jump or we have an exceedingly very good uh, thermal uh, resistance, very low thermal resistance to remove the heat. So this could be a problem. In other words, the calculation we did earlier does not apply to these cases in which you have a long time high current on the upper side or lower. And here it is. This is the example of uh, duty cycle of 0.9. We see this is the drive of the high side switch. This is the current of the high side. And this is the current of the low side. It's short here. And this is the midpoint to generate this particular voltage. Again, the picture will be sort of reversed if we are talking about a very low duty cycle, okay? Because then the high side will be short and the low side will be long. So the question is now, by how much is the conduction loss higher, okay? So here we have two problems. First of all, the magnitude of the current is the peak value. So in this case, when you are calculating the uh, power dissipated by the transistor, you have to take the peak value, which is the square root of two times the RMS. So you get twice the power. But not only that, now the power is not divided between the two for because for this particular period all the power goes to one side either the upper or lower so this is the average case and when you, do, you divide the two you see it's a correction factor of four that is a lot it's a lot 
So, coming back now to the reference design by Texas Instrument. They are showing this equation for the conduction losses per transistor. This is okay, but I think showing it in this way actually loses the reason for it, okay? Like dividing the RMS by square root of 2 has really no particular reason except that this is, you might say, a mathematical trick. You can get to it either from what I've shown, and I'll talk about it in a minute, or by doing a very long calculation of the RMS in a particular uh, duty cycle and averaging out that this will be a very long calculation, many pages, until you get this number. The real physical situation is that you have, first of all, the power loss due to the RDSON over N, if you have N transistor, and then you have to divide it by 2 because it is distributed between the high side and the low side in an equal way. And then if you want the power loss per transistor, you have to divide it again by N. So you get this 2N square, which will be also here when you square this expression. So I'm not saying that this is incorrect, this is absolutely correct, but I really don't know the way it is shown here. Now to the conclusion that they have in this uh, reference design. They're saying, Texas Instruments says that the conclusion is that the loss per fed decreases by 25 when paralleling 5 transistor. Well, this is really incorrect. When the total MOSFET area is decreased by 5, that is you are adding 5 transistor in parallel, then the loss per FET indeed will in decrease by 25. But if you are realistic and you're comparing apple to apple, and you have the same R resistance for the 1 transistor and the 5 transistor, then the power dissipated per transistor is only one-fifth because you are just distributing the same power between five transistors. And then they are saying the total inverter loss decreases by five times when five FETs are parallel. Again, this is misleading. It is reduced by five when the RDSON of each transistor is like the case in which there is one transistor. But this is not a fair comparison of course. okay? So when the total MOSFET area is decreased, then you have a decrease in the loss. But for the same silicon area, there is really no improvement in the power dissipation or the conduction loss issue. So here are my conclusions, that there is no improvement in total conduction losses when you are paralleling transistor, if indeed we are talking about the same resistance, RDSON, total or effective RDSON. And then there is no theoretical improvement, in fact, in the switching losses, you can show that, for the total gate, if you have the same total gate current, okay? And then the conduction loss may increase at very low or high electrical frequency, as I've shown, because then you are spending a lot of time when the current is high and then most of the time one side, the high side or low side, are conducting. Very important to realize that. So the improvement in the parallel connection is in the total junction to case thermal resistance. This is the real improvement, and in fact, this is the only improvement. Because if you are using a number of transistors rather than one transistor with the same RDSON as the other transistor, the many transistors, then the area that you have for cooling is larger. Also, the transistors are being put aside, at least the dies are aside, so you have a larger, say, uh, heatsink or PCB area which is also I helping to remove the heat. So this is really the benefit of paralleling transistors. But there is no free lunch. When you are paralleling transistors, there are problems. There are problems of gate drive, and then there's problem of stray inductance, 
There could be inter-fat oscillation. I'm not going into it. I'm just saying that it's not a net improvement. There are some issues that one has to take care of, but in general, it is recommended that if possible to parallel transistors in order to improve the heat conduction. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you'll find it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.